So welcome to Top Notch Farming. Sas Canova has partnered with Alberta Canova, Manitoba Canova Growers Association to deliver these presentations to you. My name is Keith Fournier and I'm a director with the, and chair of Sas Canola, of the research chair of Sas Canola, and I'm happy to be sharing today's webinar. So we're glad to have you with us here today for the second of four webinars in the 2021 Top Notch Farming webinar series. We certainly miss uh, um, being able to see you in person this year, but we are thankful for the technologies that we have available allows us to come directly to you with useful information for the upcoming growing season. The other bonus is with the cold weather this morning, no one has to start the vehicle to, to um, enjoy the webinar. The four webinars in the series cover a wide range of topics. These include the black leg and verticillium stripe management, which we had on January 22nd, the club root management on February the 11th, we are having today. The harvest and storage management will be on February 18th, a week from now. And the soil management on March the 4th. So we invite everyone to enjoy the upcoming webinars. A few housekeeping items that we have for the presentation. So continuing education credits are available for certified crop advisors and certified crop science consultants. So to earn credits, please send us your full name, CCA or CCSC number in the chat box, and we will fill in the sign-in sheet and send it to the appropriate person. Is to scan the QR code using the CCA app. And the QR code will be displayed at the end of the last presentation, just before the question and answer period. If anyone has questions during the presentation, you may type them into the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of the control panel. There will be, 30 minute, there'll be a 30-minute Q&A session at the end of the presentation, and we'll be sure to answer your questions. Please use the like button beside the questions. So the questions with the most likes, we will get addressed first. During the presentation, you will be muted so that there will be no feedback that will interfere with the audio. We encourage you to use the chat box and to add discussion to each topic. The webinar will also be recorded and the link will be sent to you at a later date. I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Dr. Ali Reza Akvan. Dr. Ali Reza Akvan is a provincial plant specialist with the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture. His work focuses mainly on plant disease surveillance, detection, diagnostics, and management. He's going to give an update on the Saskatchewan Club Root Monitoring Program in the next 30 minutes. Please welcome Dr. Alireza Akhavan. So good morning, everyone. So, so uh, Keith, uh, are you uh, seeing my screen? Yes, I can see it. Okay, that, that's great. So good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Keith, for the introduction. And thanks for inviting me uh, to give an update on Saskatchewan Collaborate Monitoring Program. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I am going to share the findings from the 2020 Saskatchewan Collaborate Monitoring Program with you. But before that, I just wanted to mention our pest monitoring uh, programs in Saskatchewan uh, in 2020, the ministry and its uh, survey partners uh, conducted more than 20 insect and disease surveys uh, on different insect and disease pests. So on the uh, disease side, in 2020, several surveys have been successfully completed, including the general canola disease survey, which looks into all the diseases of, the, of canola, including uh, uh, black leg, sclerotinia, alternario, food rot, aster yellows, and other diseases. We also had chlorboot specific survey, uh, fusarium head blight, cereal leaf diseases, and general flax and, and lentil disease surveys, and foliar and root rot disease surveys for field pea and uh, soybean. Uh, so uh, these pest surveys are very, very valuable. Uh, 
we use this the data to uh, develop fact sheet and guide discussions on pest management. Also, we use them to create forecasting maps and monitor pest levels and enable, uh, and this data helps us uh, to be able to, for early detection of pest issues across the province. Also, uh, the surveys support and direct uh, research uh, and provide information to support pest related trade discussions like the case of Black Leg and also it helps us to uh, keep the historical records. So uh, of course, this is, uh, this is a work that we need your help for it. So uh, uh, to excluding the uh, collaborate specific uh, survey, uh, which does not need permission because collaborate is declared under the Pest Control Act. For all other surveys, we need permission. So we need your help. I just ask that you please sign up to allow us access to your land to continue all of these surveys and provide you with valuable and timely information on pests. Uh, please scan this QR code on the right or to sign up or contact the Ag Knowledge Center at 1-866-457-2371. Or ag info at gov.sk.ca, and I guess uh, you will see this QR code at the end of all the presentations one more time. So, uh, Saskatchewan Collaborate Monitoring Update uh, would be the topic of today. What I am doing today is presenting on behalf of a large group of people, different teams. Uh, that contributed to this work from Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture, Saskatchewan Canola Development Commission, Saskanola, Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, SAR, Saskatchewan Crop Insurance Corporation, SDIC, and the two supporting labs, Discovery Seed Labs and Crop Protection Lab, and also the help of surveyors from uh, our industry partners, including Canola Council of Canada, Meadow Lake Co-op, Bayer Crop Science Nutrient, and also uh, volunteer agrologists and producers. So again, just to refresh, collaborate is a soil-borne disease caused by a protist named Plasmodiophora brassicae. It can reduce yield by restricting the plant ability to obtain water and nutrients from the soil. Uh, the pathogen has a uh, quite wide range of hosts in the uh, plant family Brassicaceae. Uh, namely canola, of course, and then camelina and mustard. Also, all these uh, brassicaceae vegetables like cabbage and the uh, beets uh, that belong to the same family like stinkweed, shepherd's pears, wild mustards, and so on. So uh, what does collaborate look like? So we have above ground symptoms and below ground symptoms, wilting, stunting, yellowing, uh, usually visible at late rosette to early pudding stage. Uh, noticeable, uh, perhaps wilting more noticeable on hot days and may also cause uh, seed shriveling. We also have premature ripening. Patches may be obvious, uh, particul particularly when disease levels are high. However, it is important to note that the presence of these above ground symptoms does not necessarily mean that the cause is necessarily clobbered. Many other diseases such as scrotinia stem rot and black leg also affect the plant's ability to obtain water and nutrients from the soil and result in the same above ground symptoms. Uh, uh, physio physiological stresses such as water stress in wet areas may also show the same symptoms like the bottom picture as a result, it is important to visit the suspicious patches and examine the plants uh, for below ground symptoms. So uh, disease symptoms take approximately six weeks to develop after initial infection. As a result, scutting uh, should occur later in the season from approximately mid pot to swat timing. At this time, you can also look for above ground symptoms to identify suspicious patches. Globrid galls will initially appear white and fleshy when disease pressure is low. 
Uh, the galls may be very small and occur primarily on lat lateral roots in this case. As the disease pressure increases, the size of the galls will also increase. Under high disease pressure, the, the entire root can be covered with a large gall, and there may be no or only a very few lateral roots. Later in the season or in the center of highly infected patches, the galls will not uh, uh, or will no longer appear white and fleshy. The galls will begin to rot, giving them a rotting appearance. This is the part of the life stage where the spores are returned to the soil. In many cases, the galls will be completely rotten and will, will no longer have a gall-like appearance. If this is the case, uh, we can gently dig up the plant and around the root and look for pit moss like rotten gall tissue. If these uh, plants are in the center of the patch, we can move to the edge of the patch and pull plants or gently dig up plant and look for intact galls. And to confirm claw root, we can send a sample for the, for the tissue or the soil near the suspect plant to a lab for DNA based testing. So uh, just, uh, it was just a quick introduction to uh, move on to our main topic of the day, which is uh, the Collaborate 2020 monitoring. Uh, this program was done as a partnership between SASC Canola, uh, SAR, and SCIC and the ministry, with the objectives of increasing our understanding of the distribution and severity of Collaborate, also to encourage on-farm testing for the presence of the clobber pathogen through a voluntary DNA soil testing program, and also to uh, encourage uh, external reports of clobber infested fields by producers and agrologists. So clobber monitoring in 2020 had four different components, uh, clobber specific monitoring in high risk areas of the province, also encouraging on-farm testing through the soil testing program, and continue monitoring for clobber through the general cannula disease survey as one of the diseases, and also to encourage uh, producers and agrologists uh, for external reports of clobber infested fields. So for the first component, which was clobber specific uh, monitoring in high risk areas, the target uh, was 300 to 400 fields located in high risk areas. And these fields were surveyed by PHOs, plant health officers from SARM, ministry staff and SCIC staff who were appointed as pest control officers under Pest Control Act. Uh, the spread and severity in these regions were monitored and this is a non-permission based survey. So, uh, for this survey, the focus in each field was on the entrance of the field, uh, natural water runs, low spots, and area of uh, high traffic, like uh, high machinery traffic, like old yard site or grain storage area. Another component of the program was encouraging on farm testing through the soil testing program. So soil testing bags were available at ministry regional offices, SASC Canola interested RM offices through SARM division plant health officers or via the ministry's uh, website. And the work was done through a partnership with SASC Canola and actually SASC Canola uh, covered the cost for all of this uh, soil uh, testing for all the components. This needs producer permission, either producer uh, him or herself uh, voluntarily attend, voluntarily participate, or they grant permission to their own agrologist to send this, to collect and send the samples. So uh, again, this, this was uh, kind of the uh, bags that were uh, provided to the producers to use and send the samples to the labs to be tested for the DNA of the pathogen, which the instructions uh, enclosed. So we continued monitoring for chlorobrid through the normal general cannula disease survey as one of the many diseases of cannula. So for that component, we also had additional 150 to 200 fields uh, target. Uh, ministry staff and survey volunteers uh, 
like industry agrologists helped to do this survey. Plants in each field were examined for visible symptoms of all of the diseases of canola, all of the important diseases of canola. Soil samples were collected when permission was granted by the producer or land owners and tested at Discovery Seed Lab labs this year. And the last component for this 2020 uh, collaborative monitoring program was uh, um, focusing on communication to increase the external reports of collaborative infested fields by producers and agrologists. Uh, there was a talk last week uh, through Saskatchewan Institute of Agrologists focused on ethical responsibility of agrologists in reporting of collaborative cases. Uh, this component also ena enables reporting at only a general location level uh, via phone, email, or online. So uh, to just add more value to this component, soil testing and pathotyping uh, will be done. And again, this is a partnership between SAS Canola Ministry and SARM PHOs. So uh, we met all the targets. Uh, so in overall 966, uh, 966 fields examined, 474 fields located in areas of the province where clove root and or the clove root pathogen DNA were known to occur. Uh, additional 261 fields throughout the province as part of the general canola disease survey with permission from the producers and landowners, 176 soil samples were also collected from these fields and were tested for the presence of uh, the pathogen DNA. 231 soil samples submitted directly from volunteer producers and uh, agrologists through on-farm monitoring program, which was the Chlorbic DNA soil testing program. We also received nine valuable external reports by producers and agrologists. So uh, we move to findings. Uh, so in terms of uh, uh, plants with visible symptoms, 18 new fields confirmed to have visible symptoms in 2020. This number was 14 in 2019. And uh, the composition of these 18 new fields is that we found 10 fields through this, throughout the survey and eight fields were reported externally. So uh, these uh, 18 new fields increased uh, the total number of fields with clobbered symptoms confirmed in Saskatchewan since 2017 to 75 fields. This number was 51 in January, in last January, and 57 in my, May 2020. So 57 in May 2020 plus 18 this year uh, brought this to 75 fields with visible symptoms in total for Saskatchewan. So moving to findings on uh, pathogen only through the DNA test with no visible symptoms, the collaborative pathogen DNA was detected in additional 18 fields that did not have root symptoms. And this number was only five last year, and then so jumped to 18. And uh, eight of these 18 fields uh, with visible root DNA had no root history before 2020. Uh, six of these RMs, six out of these eight RMs are located adjacent to RMs with root history, but two are located in Southwest indicating the presence of chlorbrut pathogen DNA in the region for the very first time. So uh, for the soil testing, the pathogen levels for those that they confirmed as positive ranged from 1,000 spores per gram of soil to greater than 100 million spores per gram of soil. And that 100 million uh, spores per gram of soil was found in a, in a field with uh, plants, uh, with, with kind of a uh, significant portion of plants having symptoms as well. So uh, this table uh, kind of uh, reflects the history of root in Saskatchewan. So uh, before 2017, we had zero 
visible, uh, zero commercial fields with visible symptoms. We had only two, two visible symptoms reported in non-commercial sites in 2011. For the DNA of pathogen, also we had only two reports before 2017. One was in 2008 and one was in 2012. So the program started in 2017 and found new cases for both with visible symptoms and without visible symptoms. And then these numbers started to build up uh, each year. So for visible symptoms, it started to build up from three to 43 and to 2018 and 2019, it moved to up to 57. And this year with 18 new fields with visible symptoms, it came to the total of 75 uh, fields with visible those symptoms confirmed. For the DNA of the pathogen, the DNA of the pathogen may be in ma many more fields, but these are the confirmed tested numbers that we have. So it increased to three in 2017, six 2018, 11 2019, and then with 18 new cases confirmed this year. Now the total uh, number of fields without visible symptoms, but with presence of the DNA pathogen uh, is 29 across the province. So uh, looking at the uh, maps, so this is the side-by-side -side comparison of maps of 2019 and 2020. So 2008, 2019 map cumulative testing on the left and cumulative testing 2018 to 2020 on the right. And the area that uh, has circled around that is the area that map got updated in 2020. So as we see here, we start to see, uh, so the, bl the blue color is uh, when the clawfoot pathogen detected with no visible symptoms. So there is no visible symptoms, but only the DNA of the pathogen is detected shown in blue. And we will see that this happens mostly around the area that in the past we had the visible symptoms. So the presence of the pathogen. Uh, but we also have this uh, happening like in Southwest, uh, but we should know that these two RMs uh, were found through the voluntary soil testing. So the producers voluntarily uh, participated in soil tests and then they got positive uh, results. So there may be more fields in the area with the DNA of the pathogen, which just has not been tested. So uh, the yellow color shows the RMs with one to nine fields with clawfoot symptoms. And then some of these RMs that they were yellow last year, they now turned to orange. Orange means greater or equal to 10 fields with chloride symptoms. Uh, fortunately, we don't need any other classification at this time uh, because we don't have any RM with more than 12 infected fields at this time. And hopefully uh, these uh, numbers and this map shows that Saskatchewan is still is in a very good shape to manage the disease, uh, provided that it, uh, everyone actually uh, do their due diligence. And I guess uh, Autumn will go through the management of the disease in detail. So I avoid to go to that direction. Uh, so, uh, Moving to uh, management of the chlorophyll in Saskatchewan, because Atem is going to go to the details, but I just uh, limited myself to these three points for Saskatchewan. We are still focused on biosecurity to prevent the spread of chlorophyll into fields and areas where it is not yet present. And we also uh, focus on keep a spores level low to minimize yield loss. Uh, as we uh, just uh, think that the pathogen DNA or the pathogen itself uh, is present in many more fields without visible symptoms as of, as of now. So with a good management, uh, the pathogen level can just be low and not able to hopefully to produce the disease. 
And also we need to ensure that cloud with resistant varieties stay effective for as long as possible through rotation of the varieties and crop. I just uh, limit myself to these three points as I know that we will have, we'll have a presentation at the end close to the details of this, uh, uh, these points on management side. So I guess uh, it was a bit uh, quicker than I thought. Uh, so this was the update from 2020 program. Uh, this week we started to, uh, to plan for 2021. So uh, we welcome any comments on uh, what you think uh, the 2021 Chlorbit monitoring program should uh, look like. And then, uh, then uh, we will put together the proposal for, uh, for late February, early March, and then we will see how it goes for 2021 Chlorwood Monitoring Program. So I uh, appreciate all of the opportunities given to me today to uh, present this update. And then, uh, then uh, it was a great, uh, great pleasure for me. And then I will end just with showing the uh, rural municipalities uh, map that uh, was uh, updated yesterday uh, with, for, 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 for RMs with Clawbrut, Clawbrut bylaws. So we will see that now uh, more RMs are included in the map and hopefully we will see even more in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, for the opportunity and also for listening to my talk. Thank you very much, Keith. I am done. Okay. Thank you for very much for your presentation, Dr. Heaven. Uh, the I guess one of the the flags that I saw on that map was that we always in Saskatchewan we always thought that you know that that south area swift current was sort of a a safe zone from it and and it uh, the map this year with uh, a couple of the rms down there show uh, made it onto the club route map shows us that there there really isn't a safe area that's absolutely right keith uh, so uh because uh, we we should know that these goals that we see uh uh, ultimately uh, kind of disintegrate and release a mass of spores. Uh, so, and this mass of spores can move uh, with any way that soil itsel itself can move. So less conducive uh, conditions uh, is not a guarantee that we don't see the pathogen in the area of the province, which, uh, which are less conducive for disease. But one point that uh, I uh, want to raise at this, at this uh, moment is these uh, two fields were found in an area which has a very good uh, rotation. So I really hope that the pathogen was present uh, there, but it's not hopefully able to build up the population to get to the level which needs for symptoms development. Thank you very much, Alireza. So, if you have Thank any you. questions, please type them into the Q&A box. We will address them in the 30 minute Q&A session at the end of the last presentation. Also, if you are a CCA or CCSC, please send us your full name, CCA or CCSC number in the chat box. And you also have uh, the ability to scan your, the QR code at the end of the last presentation to be able to be registered in that way. Our second speaker, is Dr. Steven Strokoff. Dr. Strokoff is a professor at the University of Alberta. His area of research focuses on field crop pathology with a particular emphasis on the club root of canola. He will be talking about club root research in canola. Dr. Strokoff, please. Thank you very, thank you very much, Keith. Um, let's see if I can share my, my, uh, my screen here and put up my presentation. Uh, let's see. Uh, hopefully, can you guys see it okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. Thank you very much. And, and uh, so, so yeah, thanks for the invitation to participate in this, uh, in this uh, webinar series. 
So I'd like to give a little bit of a club research update today. I won't get to everything, but I'll touch on, on a few different areas. So, so I'm Steve Stralka, as I was just introduced. I just also wanted to acknowledge other people who contributed to the material I'll be presenting today. Uh, we have our senior technician here in the plant pathology lab at the University of Alberta, uh, Victor Manoli. Dr. We Strokov, we yeah. can't see your screen if you're sharing it. Oh, uh, you Please. cannot see. Okay. No. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Uh, okay, let's share. Uh, hold on now. Yes, Hopefully. we can see it now. Thank you. Can you can you see my presentation now? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah, that's the uh, I, uh, that's the one unnerving thing about this that it, you can talk. At one time, I was recording a, a Zoom lecture for my class, pre-recording it, and then I realized I hadn't turned on the record functions for for about twenty five minutes. I was talking to myself, but so so uh, thanks for pointing uh, that out. Uh, so let me just get my pointer again. Okay. Yeah. So thanks again for the invitation to speak at, uh, at today's webinar. So yeah. So I'd just like to acknowledge some of the other people who who, who contributed some of the information I'll be presenting today. Uh, Victor Manoli, senior uh, research technician in, in our lab here at the uh, plant pathology at the University of Alberta. Andrea Botero Ramirez is a PhD student. Uh, Keisha Holman is, was a master's student, recently defended and is now starting a, a PhD. Yuan Egu is a postdoc in our group. Michael Harding is a plant pathologist with Alberta Agriculture uh, and, and Forestry and has been uh, involved helping us with working together with, on the surveys and, and Greg Daniels, a technician working with him. And Dr. Xiaofen Huang is my colleague and a professor of applied plant pathology at the University of Alberta and we work together on, on, on club root and many other issues. So this is an outline of my presentation. I'll, I'll start off with an overview of the 2020 Alberta club root survey and the current distribution of the disease. Then I want to talk a little bit about some studies we've done with uh, Andrea Botero about within field spread of, of club root. Then move on to, discuss, to a discussion of pathotype surveillance and, and the virulence of, of some of these pathotypes on club root resistant canola and just wrap up with some brief conclusions. So Ali Reza did a really good job uh, providing an overview uh, of the disease. So I just have this very short slide, just, just reiterating it's a, it's a soil borne disease of crucifer caused by this uh, protozoan plasmodiophora brassicae and attacks the, the roots causing the, the, uh, these galls or clubs to form and uh, which interfere with water and nutrient uptake. And, and so then the above ground part plants are stunted, wilted and, and can suffer very severe yield and, and quality losses. So in terms of the Alberta club root survey, we've been conducting surveys in Alberta for club root since 2004. So the first couple of cases of the disease, 12 cases of the disease were found in, in 2003. And so since 2004, there's been an annual club root survey. These surveys are usually conducted uh, by the University of Alberta in collaboration with uh, uh, Alberta Agriculture and Forestry. And we do try to work uh, together with the ag field and indeed in individual counties and municipalities. So we coordinate our visits with them and we exchange information. So in 2020, we surveyed 620 canola fields for club root and four mustard crops. And in our surveys, usually we are just looking for the symptoms of the disease because club root is so prevalent in so many areas. We typically don't do um, DNA testing for the presence in non-symptomatic fields unless it's part of another study. And when we selected our fields for surveying, we typically will select them either randomly to just to try to get a good coverage of the province. So, so visit at least to a few fields, whatever uh, canola is being in regions where canola is being grown. But we also do some targeted surveying where, where we get when we get reports of club root in an area. And like I mentioned, our visits are usually this coordinated with the agricultural film in each district, just to make sure we, we, you know, the left hand knows what the right hand is doing and we're working together. So when we do our surveys, typically we, we'll arrive at a field, we'll, we'll extensively, intensively sample the, the field approach because that's where we, we 
typically find the most, you know, are most likely to find club root. And within a 30 to 50 square meter area at the field entrance, we'll sample about a 50 to 100 plants. If we don't see any symptoms, we usually will just move on simply because we, we have so many fields to, to go through. But if we do find any symptoms, then we, we, we survey the field much more extensively. So we walk it in a W pattern and, and, and basically uh, examine all routes within one meter squared areas along 10, uh, along 10 points uh, along the arm of this W pattern. So in the end, we have about, we basically would, would look at, at the, the plants, at the roots at, at 10 meters squared uh, area over the entire field. And usually we do this after swathing because it's easier to walk the field and also farmers are less sensitive to, to us pulling, pulling so many plants uh, after, after the crop's been swathed. And we, we'll rate the plant on a zero to three scale of club root severity, zero meaning there's no symptoms, three meaning that all the roots are severely uh, clubbed. And then we use that information to calculate a uh, uh, disease severity index for each particular crop. And whenever possible, we also collect survey information from independent inspections conducted by the ag field. And so while we may only do uh, maybe 10 or 20 fields in a, in a particular uh, county or municipal district, in some cases, ag field men will, will do a lot more serving in their own area and, and will we'll try to collect that information. They often will not do it necessarily in the same way we are doing it. So, so, so we sometimes will get information from them where basically just club was found or not found, but not necessarily uh, the, uh, the, the, the information on, on, on the disease severity. So in terms of the results of the 2020 survey, we found club root in 66 of the 620 canola crops that we surveyed. So a little bit over 10%, about 11%. Uh, Most crops were lightly to moderately infected. So, so this, is, this little graph just shows the number of fields and the club root severity in each. So 39 of the 60, 66 were mildly infect, infected. So meaning that there was, let's say less than 10% disease severity. Uh, 24 were moderately infected, so about 20, uh, having 10 to 60% disease severity, and three were severely infected. And this is kind of typical of what we find most years. We'll find that most fields have a low to moderate levels of inf infection, or, or most crops have a low to moderate level of infection, and about 5 to 10% are severely infected. Like I mentioned, we did a, we looked at a few mustard crops, but we didn't find any club root in the four mustard crops that we visited. In addition to these uh, cases that we found in 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 our in our in the kind of the province-wide survey from the University of Alberta and uh, Alberta Agriculture, there were 313 additional cases recorded during inspection, in independent inspections by the ag fieldmen. So, so these were cases in addition to the ones we had identified. So that brings, when we add the, the ones we found plus the ones from the ag fieldmen, we have a, a, a total of 379 new infestations identified uh, in Alberta in 2020. We have probably about four, a bit over 4,000 fields where, where club root has been confirmed in the province. And, what, and we had the first confirmed cases in Grand Prairie, Wheatland and Smoky River as shown by the, here. So, so the disease started initially here right in central Alberta near, near the, the Edmonton area. So in this map, the, the darker the red or the stronger the reddish color, the more club root there has been identified. And it's been moving over the years in all areas. And, and since about 2017, it's been moving into the peace country of Northwest Alberta. And it's also moving now into Southern Alberta. And really now club root has been confirmed in 44 of 66 counties, municipal districts, and special areas in Alberta where club root is grown. So it's probably about, it's on, it's about two thirds of those districts now have at least a few cases of confirmed club root. So it is quite widespread in the province. If you're interested in getting uh, more details than, than what I've gone into here, this, this report, the Club Root Survey report, has been submitted and accepted for publication in the Canadian Plant Disease Survey. It should be out in a few months, but if you're, in, you know, if you're anxious to look at it, we we, I can just send me an email or, and, and I can send you a preprint uh, as, as soon as possible. 
this I like showing this this uh, graph or this map uh, developed by by Yuan because it just shows club root spread over time from 2005 to to 2020 and and it kind of highlights what I was mentioning, the spread from central Alberta, eventually to eastern and, and the western edge of the canola producing regions and then into the north and, to, and into the south. Now, we've estimated uh, that the leading edge of the epidemic moves about 20 kilometers per year. But, but the reality that we have is that we haven't done any real modeling of the sea spread or epidemic rates. These are kind of just I know back of the nap napkin calculations based on you know uh, how you know where we've been finding it year after year and just kind of dividing it by the, by the number of years, the distance by the number of years. We are trying to do some more um, some more uh, detailed uh, modeling of, of the sea spread. We're working uh, with the postdoc Yuan. Uh, in collaboration with uh, a plant epidemiologist, Frederick Amelin, who uh, who's, uh, works at AgroCampus West in, in Brittany, France, and Mark Lewis, who's, uh, who's a, a modeler working in mathematical biology here at the University of Alberta. And we're trying to uh, use more, uh, more robust methods to try to, to de de determine the, the rate of spread, the epidemic rate, and so on. So this is so it's things using strategies such as the mi uh, minimum convex polygon method. And this is just uh, one slide uh, just showing, for instance, uh, treating uh, different approaches, for instance, uh, uh, looking at the distribution, you know, for instance, kind of a linear uh, the distribution here from the, from the center and either considering this as, as uh, long distance dispersal events versus part of the, of, of, of the annual dispersal. So it's, very interesting work, and, and we are finding some 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 interesting results. Unfortunately, it's been delayed a little bit because this fellow Frederick Amelin, he's uh, he's an epidemiologist, but he was kind of co-opted in France because of the COVID nineteen epidemic, and and so so they moved him away from working on plants to help out some of the modeling with COVID and so on. So hopefully, as 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 the as the COVID situation comes under control, we can we can. Uh, Keep moving forward on this on this project, but but it has been. Uh, uh, I'm looking forward to 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 completing the analysis because because there are some interesting results. But we're the other question has been the 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 pathogen spatial patterns at the field level, where it occurs and how it has been uh, spreading with within fields. And to be honest, epidemiological studies. Uh, on the spatial patterns of, of Plasmodium photobrassicae or the and its inoculum in, uh, on the field level are, are fairly scarce. We've done a little bit of work uh, with our, our research associate previously, Thyssen Kao. Uh, there's some, been a little bit of work from, from, from Sweden. And uh, so there's been, a, there's been a few reports, but, but really not really any, any thorough examination, at least to our knowledge. So I, uh, I mentioned Andrea Botero, she's a PhD student, and one of the objectives of her research has been to evaluate inoculum density and spatial patterns and their relationship with soil characteristics. So to try to get a better handle on, on, on uh, what's going on. So as part of her work, she's done intensive sampling at four field locations. These are located uh, in central central Alberta, in two counties, uh, kind of not too far from Edmonton, uh, at four fields uh, which we've labeled F1 to F4, and and that they were which were intensively sampled in 2017 and 2019. Oh, here's here's just the the the, the location of the field. So Westlock County and and Sturgeon County, I think. Uh, Edmonton is just just off the map here. So, so this the the sampling strategy was in 2017 was just to get a, a feel for uh, or characterize very clearly what was happening in each field. So so it was basically sampled in a grid pattern, 80 by 80 meters, uh, and and between well close to about 100 samples were were collected from each from each field. These soil samples were uh, 500 grams of soil uh, taken to about a 15 centimeter depth. In 2019, 
we use the 2017 data to 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 uh, I guess more strategically target our sample. So there was an intensification of the sampling around positive samples found in 2017 in, in the fields F1, F2, and F3. And F, F4, we still sampled the entire field because there, ha uh, because there hadn't been that, that much club root initially found. So we took another uh, 100 samples. So we collected all these hundreds of samples. And so, so then e each sample was processed through this kind of flow uh, workflow. First, it was uh, quantifying the inoculum present in, uh, in each sample. Uh, conventional PCR was used to determine whether or not there was any p a DNA, so yes or no. Uh, quantitative PCR analysis was conducted that if, particularly if there was the presence of pathogen DNA, it was conducted to measure how much inoculum was there expressed in, in resting spores per gram of soil. And this was done for all samples. Then, uh, then e each sample was also uh, um, examined for, for, P, for, for the pH of the soil. And also commercially, we've taken to a, to a soil testing lab to quantify available boron, calcium, uh, and as well as uh, magnesium, uh, just to, um, to 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 understand, you know, what 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 the status on each soil sample was. We also used information from weather stations surrounding the field, uh, obtained through the Alberta Climate Information Service, to to uh, to examine or analyze prevailing wind directions uh, during the periods of the study. The analysis uh, included various spatial statistics approaches, uh, things like Moran's eye, which is a measure of auto, uh, auto -correl correlation, uh, uh, production of semi-variograms, which are basically graphs of how uh, semi-variance uh, semi changes at the di as the distance between observations changes. Uh, there was a, a Bayesian particle spatial approaches taken to look at inoculum density versus uh, soil parameters. So, so uh, uh, Andrea was the one that did most of this analysis, but, but anyhow, there was a, we, 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 we did a lot of uh, evaluation of the data we were getting. And, and just gonna highlight some of the main findings. Uh, we, uh, of course, if you're, if you're in, in uh, really interested, we, we, you, know, you can contact us and we can give you more details. And Andrea will probably be defending in, in about June. So you can also welcome to connect to her, to her defense. But uh, basically some of, the, some of the, the most salient findings was that most positive samples Occurred within the uh, were found within the field edges, so within ten meters of, of 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 the of the edge of each field, and or at the field entrance. That wasn't all that um, surprising because from from other work we had done earlier, it seemed to be a trend, particularly the, the finding it near the entrances. Club root was also uh, occurring in a patchy distribution, and these patches in two thousand seventeen. They ranged in, in diameter from about 40 meters to about 346 meters. And in 2019, they had actually increased in size to, from, to about, from about 77 meters to about 635 meters. The pH and, and these other soil, soil components uh, did not, at least in the fields that we examined, did not have an important effect on, on the P. brassicae inoculum density. Now, this doesn't mean that our results with respect to these soil chemical properties, uh, it doesn't mean that they didn't necessarily affect pathogen inoculum density, but rather they suggest that we had uh, other un underlying spatial processes, at least in these fields, that had a greater influence on, this, on the patterns of spatial distribution. And certainly we found from work we've done uh, here in Alberta in commercial fields and also work we've done with Bruce Gosen, uh, more in, in, green, in greenhouse and, and, and in growth room, that the pH, there is certainly a correlation between P, uh, uh, pH and, and club root severity, meaning that as, as the pH decreases, the club root sever severity tends to get worse, but it's not a strong correlation as we would have guessed from reading you know, old literature. And, and there's other factors that can have a, a play a bigger role than the pH, for instance, uh, 
the the length of the rotation, the you know how much moisture has been present, you know what the inoculum level is, and so on. So 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 certainly, I don't think growers that are in a you know field with higher pH can can really see themselves as being immune uh, to having club root. I did mention that there was increases in patch growth, and this. The average patch growth was about 220 meters in two years. And there was a growth of the patches in, in each of the fields uh, that we monitored. The, the, the smallest growth was about 40 meters where one patch kind of doubled. And, and, some, and in some cases, the, 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 the patch almost tripled in, in size or more than tripled in size over, over, over these uh, three years of the study. And we found that the increases in patch size were related to inoculum density and the number of positive samples. So the more inoculum density, the more chance, the more growth of the patches. However, we didn't find an effect of, of the numbers of years of canola in, the, in those three years. So that didn't necessarily affect the, the patch growth, which in a way makes sense because the, if the soil is being worked, probably the, the most important factors that are, are there uh, are, are whether or not there was, uh, there was inoculum to begin with, but the other um, factors involved would probably be similar whether or not it was canola or some other crop being grown there. In, in, in three of the four fields, the spread of the infested patches was, was, was anisotropic, which just means that basically it varied with direction. So there was more growth in certain directions, geographical directions than in others. It was isotropic in one field. So that means it grew the same in all directions in one of the fields. It's interesting that in two of the fields, the anisotropic movement of the pathogen or the growth of the patch was uh, 157.5 degrees northwest, because this was when we did when we looked at the wind speeds and analyzed the direction of peak wind from April 2017 to April uh, to October 2019, for the weather stations near those fields, the, the those peak winds were more than 35 kilometers per hour, and also mainly oriented in the northwest direction. So it looked like. Uh, on, on the field scale, the wind was actually helping to, to disseminate the, the, the pathogen. And this is actually consistent with earlier work we've done with another graduate student, Derek Rennie, uh, where we had done just dust monitoring on the edges of the field. And, and we had found that there was a considerable amount of, of, of resting spores found in dust, in windblown dust, and had also led us to, 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 to suggest that that the wind is having an inf uh, helping to spread this pathogen at least on a, on a on a local scale on a, on a very uh, regional scale farming operations can also influence the direction of patch spread and and in one of the fields uh, on the third field that had anisotropic expansion it seemed that maybe the, it was the uh, the farming operations that that were contributing to the, to to the spread in one direction so that's what I wanted to briefly mention about uh, uh, about uh, this, the within field spread. I also wanted to touch a little bit on pathotype surveillance. So of course, we need to know where the pathogen occurs and how it's spreading, but we also need to understand the Plasmodifora brassicae pathotype structure and distribution because this allows breeders to, to screen against the predominant or the correct pathotypes basically allows them to, to target the correct pathotypes when they're trying to develop genetic resistance. It also allows preemptive detection of, uh, of pathotype shifts, so changes in the pathotype composition. In Canada, for the last few years, we've been defining pathotypes based on their virulence patterns on what we call the Canadian club root differential set or CCD set. Basically, this is just a series of brassica hosts that are inoculated with the pathogen resting spores, which we extract from the roots. And then we, we, we rate the reactions of the brassica of the different hosts to the different isolates or strains of the pathotype. And based on which of these hosts are resistant or susceptible, we can group these isolates into different pathotypes. Uh, pathotyping is, 
uh, it's, it's how we do it is uh, when we were inoculating onto plants, it's, it's a quite a um, long process that can take several months to complete. You know, we need to extract the spores from the infected roots. Then in greenhouses, in replicated greenhouse trials, we need to inoculate many, many seedlings of, of all the different hosts let them grow for six weeks, then rate them for symptom development. I don't have time to talk about it today, but we are working with another student, Heather So, and, and our research associate, uh, Dr. Leonardo Gal Galindo, to try to develop a molecular methods to, to, to speed up the pathotyping. And, and there's, uh, again, th that work is ongoing and, and should help to at least uh, streamline some of the pathotyping we're doing. But in any case, through traditional pathotyping, uh, you know, we, we, we started to notice beginning about four years after the introduction of cloud-resistant canola, that there was some shift in the predominant pathotype. In particular, it, it, there was a shift to some pathotypes that could break the resistance in club resistant canola. So these, these canola varieties first were introduced in 2009 and by 2013, we found the first cases, first field where, where there was symptom development on what was supposed to be a resistant variety. So prior to 2013, uh, pathotype 3H was predominant. This was a, a pathotype that was very virulent on canola, but canola that didn't carry any resistant trait. And this was, we, we used to find it in about 90% of the fields. And there was a total of five pathotypes recorded in Canada. And all of these pathotypes could be controlled by club re resistant canola. So any canola that had a club resistance uh, designation trait was equally effective, basically, at controlling these pathotypes. Since 2013, we started to see a proliferation of quote-unquote uh, new pathotypes. And many of these pathotypes, these new, new pathotypes can overcome a club, uh, the resistance in club resistant canola. And we found a real diversity of, uh, in the pathotypes be, uh, beginning in about 2013. To date, uh, we found 36 pathotypes that, uh, across Canada that, have been, that could be distinguished with the C CCD set. 19 of these uh, can overcome the resistance in at least some of the club resistant canola varieties. And this just shows a chart of, of the various gra graphs. Another, about half of the uh, pathotypes, although we, we are detecting them, they don't seem to be able to overcome the resistance in, in CR canola. However, despite this large number of pathotypes, only a few are common or, or widely distributed. This is just uh, from, a, from a paper that's been recently uh, accepted for publication by, by Keisha Holman, who's, who just finished her master's and is now starting her PhD, to look at the prevalence of Plasmodiophora brassica pathotypes across uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. So from, two, uh, from collections made in 2017 and 2018, we looked at uh, 166 isolates representing 166 different fields. Most of these fields came from Alberta, so 146 were from Alberta, 10 came from Manitoba, and 10 came from Saskatchewan. When you, what you can see is in Alberta, uh, pathotype 3A and 3D are predominant in those fields. And these are resistance breaking pathotypes. So the ones that have a little star are resistance breaking. Pathotype 3H was still found uh, quite commonly, but it was no longer prevalent. Manitoba, we found actually, uh, uh, we found nine pathotypes in 10 fields. So it was quite, uh, quite diverse pathotype composition. We're still trying to understand why that is, but we did find one field that had uh, pathotype 3A, so the resistance breaking pathotype. In Saskatchewan, the situation is more similar to how it may have been in Alberta 10 years ago. Of the 10 fields, eight had pathotype 3H, so the old non-resistance breaking pathotype, and two had uh, this, this pathotype 5L, which we also find in Manitoba, which doesn't break uh, resistance. We also have done some work with Dr. Venkat Chapara in North Dakota, looking at their pathotypes, and they seem to have um, some unique pathotypes, but some that are quite similar to what's found in, in Manitoba, which may be perhaps related to, to the common border and, and, and canola production in the Red River Valley, potentially, but that's just a hypothesis. 
So the predominant pathotypes in Alberta, at least, continue to be 3A, 3D, and the old pathotype 3H. In this map, 3, 3A is shown in red in these maps in 2017 and 2018. Uh, most other new pathotypes are confined to specific regions or have been identified only from single spore isolations. So these are quite rare pathotypes. Uh, and the genetics, in, in the cases where a, a farmer finds they have a very rare pathotype in their field, potentially the genetics may not be an, resistance genetics may not be an option for club root management in those situations because maybe companies are not gonna spend efforts in, in, you know, in, in breeding for resistance against a very rare pathotype. I only have about five, uh, five minutes left. So I just wanted to, to, to finish talking about uh, the situation with respect to second generation resistance. I think many of you are aware that the resistance in most club resistant varieties introduced from 20, 2009 to 2014, and even since then, appears to have come from a, the same source or a similar source, which is a European winter oilseed rape called Mendel. And there was a major gene for resistance in that variety that seems to have been introgressed or put into most of our, of our or many of our canola varieties. And this is now often referred to as first generation resistance because it was the first resistance that became a, a commercially available uh, to Canadian growers. However, since the emergence of new, pre, new P brassicae pathotypes that break first generation resistance, there has been an effort by many breeders to develop canola with what's called second or next generation resistance. However, the basis of the second or, uh, generation resistance is not in the public domain. And to be honest, we cannot really say whether it's the same across varieties or, 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 or the, the different, different companies and different varieties carry different types of second generation resistance. And, and it's likely the second option that there's differences in, in, different, in different products. And in some cases, it may even be stack resistance genes. But in any case, when we talk about resistance breaking pathotypes, most of these have been confirmed to be virulent or be able to cause disease on first generation resistance. The situation on second generation resistance is less clear. Uh, if you're interested, this is from the Canola Council of Canada website, clubroot.ca website. Uh, and you can, this is a list of all the registered uh, canola varieties that carried a, a club uh, resistance claims. And the ones with two stars have so-called second generation resistance or a resistance that's different from the Mendel resistance. So we have been looking uh, at some of the second generation resistance and, and how it's holding up to, to some strains uh, of the pathogen. So this is from a greenhouse study from Keisha Holman as, as she's starting her PhD. She basically tested eight cultivars carrying second generation resistance, which were inoculated with 22 field isolates of the pathogen recovered from field grown plants of second generation resistant varieties that were developing club root symptoms. And we wanted to make sure that this, these symptoms were not related. We wanted to see if this was actually new, different strains of the pathogen that could break second generation resistance, or it was just that, you know, other factors like volunteers and so on. And these, we, we pathotyped these as well, and they represented nine known and three novel pathotypes. And what you can see is that in, uh, so, so the ones in blue, ECDO2 is just a, a club resistant control. ECDO5 is a universally susceptible variety, susceptible to, to, res to everything. This first generation club resistance check is just a variety that carries first generation resistance. And you can see these are, uh, the ones in green are eight canola cultivars from different suppliers uh, carrying second generation resistance. Some of them are holding up very well. They, they, they develop very little disease in response. So I'm showing here just the average reaction across all 22 pathotypes. Some of them are performing very well, but some to be, seem to be quite susceptible to these 22 isolates. So, so, so um, it, it's a little bit disconcerting because it appears that some of these new cultivars that, that carry second generation resistance are vulnerable to pathotype shifts or, or are already susceptible to existing components of the pathogen population. So I just, 
you know, second generation resistance is an important tool, but definitely not a magic bullet, just like first generation resistance. And we recently were awarded a, a new CARP project funded by Alberta Canola, SAS Canola, and the Western Grains Research Foundation, where we'll use this to, to this, pro this support to look at this issue in greater detail. So you can expect further up updates in, in the future. So in conclusion, I was told to keep it to less than 35 minutes and I'm 34. So um, Clubroot continued to spread in Alberta in 2020. When we looked on a field level, uh, infested patches grew uh, within each field every year. And this was related mainly to the inoculum density. Uh, uh, so the, 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 the greater the pathogen or uh, density in those patches, the more rapidly they grew. We've been finding this proliferation of new pathotypes, about half of which, which overcome resistance. And in, in Alberta, at least, the most common are the resistance breaking pathotype 3A, 3D, and the old pathotype 3H. And finally, some, well, some pathogen isolates appear to overcome the resistance in some canola cultivars with second generation resistance. So we just have to make sure we, we practice proper resistance stewardship for all club resistant cultivars, whether they carry first or second generation resistance. And in the end, I'd just like to thank all the funders and as well as, of course, the collaborators and the research teams, uh, you know, none of this work would be possible without all these, all these uh, colleagues and, and funders. Thank you. My name is Miki Mihoguli. I'm the research extension specialist at SAS Canola. Um, I will continue on the hosting duties on behalf of KEYS. Um, if you are CCA or CCSC, please send us your full name, CCA number, or CCSC number in the chat box. Uh, there will also QR code will be available at the end of the presentation. With that, I'm now pleased to introduce our third speaker, Autumn Barnes. Autumn is the agronomy specialist at the Canola Council of Canada. She covers the Southwest prairies. Her lead topic with Canola Council of Canada is club root management. Autumn also chairs the Canadian club root steering committee. Today, she will provide us with the club root best management practices. Welcome Autumn, we look forward to your presentation. Hey, Mickey, thanks for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thanks so much for the invite and thanks everybody for coming today. I look forward to, uh, to the q and I certainly enjoyed um, Ali Reza and Steve's presentations before mine. I'm going to talk today about uh, club root best management practices. If I can get my slides to advance, there we go. So, so this is uh, this is me. Um, I I work with the Canola Council of Canada. I started as an agronomy specialist in 2013. Um, I've been working in plant establishment uh, since then. Um, but our our club root lead Dan Orchard in the fall moved on to private industry, and uh, and I jumped at the opportunity to take a leadership role in club root. It's such a fascinating uh, a fascinating disease. So I'm the, the Canola Council Club Root lead. Uh, I, I get to chair the Club Root Steering Committee. And then I'm also still working on a, a plant establishment survey, which um, I'll mention any chance I can get, but, but everybody should keep their eyes open for it this spring. Um, this picture is myself and my, my family in Hawaii last, uh, last year, right around this time, right before um, I guess the world went pretty sideways. Uh, so if any of you guys needed a beach picture today in, in the cold weather, I guess this is this is it. I'm, I'm dreaming of it these days. My email address is at the bottom there. If you have any questions after this and you want to get in touch, then, then definitely look me up. Um, the Canola Council of Canada uh, has a team of agronomy specialists across the prairies. You can see the map here. Um, Gregory Seklich uh, from Peace in Central Alberta actually recently took a position with CropLife in Australia. Um, so, so this map is out of date as of about two weeks ago, so it'll be updated pretty soon uh, with his replacement. But definitely, if you have club root questions, um, you could either get in touch with, with myself, um, with the Canola Council, or, um, or other agronomy specialists that are on this map. Uh, the Canola Council of Canada, we're a national value chain organization. So our membership is made up of the Canola Growers, uh, Canola Grower Associations, Alberta Canola, Manitoba Canola Growers, and SAS Canola. Um, their levy dollars in part come to us. We also have board members and representatives who are uh, 
representatives of life science companies, uh, the Canadian Oilseed Processors Association, and the Western Grain Elevator Association. Throughout my presentation, I'm going to have a few poll questions. Um, so there should be a poll popping up. I'll give you a couple seconds and see if, um, if the person who's managing that on the back end. Oh, wonderful. Um, so if everybody could just click on the multiple choice option, is there club root in your community? Um, yes, no, or not sure. And this graphic down here is actually um, kind of looks, I guess, like a like a little um, like a little COVID um, cell now that we uh, now that we have that in our lives. But this was actually made up for uh, one of the club root videos. Um, years ago, I guess. So I kind of like it. I found it looking through Dan's old files. I think we can probably see the answers here in a sec. Wonderful. Okay, so 63% of you said yes, it's in your community. 26% said no, and 11 said not sure. 11% said not sure. Awesome. Thank you. So I'm going to have a couple more of these questions just to kind of break up um, break up the presentation. It's sort of always tough being the last person, especially following such great presentations like Ali Reza and Steve. So I'm going to try and keep this a little bit fun and interactive. If I can actually advance my slides, that would be wonderful. There we go. Um, so Steve and Ali Reza did a great job presenting the data for Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, but this is what I've sort of patched together for a, for a prairie map. We're sort of working towards a harmonized map so that they're all in the same format. Um, but I guess the important point for today is cumulatively um, in Alberta, there's over 4,000 symptomatic fields kind of starting from an epicenter around Edmonton. Um, in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, they do um, soil surveys in addition to the symptomatic, like digging, looking for symptomatic plants. And so you can see um, Saskatchewan now has um, 75 symptomatic fields, over 29 DNA positives. And in Manitoba, um, there's 39 symptomatic club root fields and 286 DNA positives. And this is cumulative. This isn't just found in 2020. This, was, this is cumulative over the years. Uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, um, in these two maps, the orange equates to um, fields with greater than or equal to 10 fields with symptoms. Some of these yellow municipalities in Manitoba, though, had nine fields with symptoms, so they're they're on the on the tipping point. And then the blue indicates um, that club root DNA was detected um, via soil sample. And then um, you can see, as as Ali Reza mentioned, you know, down in Swift Current in this area where we'd really not expect to see uh, club root being a huge issue, um, the DNA was found there. So um, I guess the main take home from this is. Uh, yes, it can be anywhere. And you should expect that if it's not in your community yet, it's probably going to be there. So we should definitely be thinking about what to do to prevent it coming um, and to minimize the impact of it when it gets there. This is a really simplified life cycle of Plasmodiophora brassicae. Um, the, basically what happens, there's these tiny little resting spores in the soil. Um, they germinate, they produce these little zoo spores, they swim in the soil water and infect root hairs. Um, then more zoospores are, are released, more root tissue gets infected, and then that infected root tissue starts to restrict the movement of water and nutrient in the plant and makes these big galls, which we kind of think about when we see or when we think of club root. Um, you usually start to see those galls around flowering timing, and then when the plant starts to senesce and mature, that's when those roots and galls start to decompose, and they'll go from that fleshy, white, hard, sort of typical club root appearance to sort of like a wet sawdust, squishy brown mass, and it's at that point releasing all of those spores um, right back into the soil to, uh, to start the infection process again um, next year. So when I, um, back in 2018, when Clubber was first found um, southeast of Calgary, I started, um, you know, doing a lot more digging into club root in southern Alberta. It wasn't a huge focus um, for me. Uh, prior to that, other than visiting central Alberta and visiting other club root areas. And one thing I found was just that the club root, uh, the club root world is so complicated. There's just so much to know. And we have people um, like great, great researchers and scientists and breeders who, who know a lot of this technical information. 
but we also need to try and keep this really simple because it's easy to get lost in all this complicated Clubroot information. So when I'm talking about Clubroot management today, I'm going to be talking about keeping Clubroot spores or P. brassicae spores low and keeping them local. So to keep them low, we'll implement crop rotation, scout, grow clubroot resistant hybrids, control brassica weeds in all crops, um, and use some patch management strategies. And then to keep spores local or to keep them from moving around, um, we'll have some sanitation or biosecurity. We'll want to reduce tillage and soil movement. And then we could also implement some patch management uh, strategies. So I'm going to break these down over the next few slides. Um, this one, maybe you guys have seen this before, or some of you had. Um, this is a really great illustration that Mary Ruth McDonald, who's a researcher at the University of Guelph, um, put together. And, and what this is, is this is brassica plants um, grown in soil with different spore concentrations. So at less than a thousand spores per gram, um, you can see that the root's pretty clean. And I guess before I get in, into this too far, we don't want to get so hung up on the numbers you know, if you have a thousand spores per gram, you might not see this exact symptom, but this is a really good illustration of how club root grows and gets bigger and causes more problems as the spore concentration gets higher. So less than a thousand clean roots, around a thousand in this case, uh, spores per gram of soil. Um, you can see that there's some root swellings right here. Hopefully you guys can see my, my uh, pointer. Um, so there's some root swellings here at 1,000, at 10,000 uh, gram or spores per gram of soil. You can see that we're starting to see some bigger fleshy galls here. Um, 100,000 spores per gram of soil. There's more, more galling um, around, uh, around this plant. And then this is a million spores per gram of soil. So more spores per gram of soil means bigger galls, more risk to your yield, more risk of novel pathotypes being present. Um, more resting spores being released back into the soil to start even more infections next year. And that equates to requiring an even longer crop rotation. Um, if we had, say, a 90% reduction from 100 million spores, that would still leave us 10 million spores. So clubroot is really a numbers game, and we want to keep those spore concentrations low. Crop rotation is a really good way to do that. There's a lot of good science supporting a minimum two-year break between canola crops. So that's a one in three-year rotation or more um, that that would lead to about a 90% reduction in resting spores. That 10% um, is still going to be there later. So remember, if you start with it, you know, if you, if you find club root when it's a huge problem and you have a big dead patch like in this picture, um, you're probably going to have to be rotating out of canola for longer. Um, and again, I mentioned that slower decline after two years. So there's a lot of really great reasons for having a crop rotation um, that, that involves more than, than wheat and canola. Um, grower preference, whether there's uh, you know, other crops that you enjoy growing or that are more marketable, um, more profitable in your area, that's awesome. Uh, whoops, we just don't want to get to the point where, um, where you're forced to have a longer crop rotation because your spore concentrations are so high um, that you can't profitably grow canola anymore or perhaps that your spore concentrations are really high and you have some unmanageable pathotypes and you just can't grow, uh, grow canola profitably anymore. So I really urge you growers and, and those advising growers to start thinking about crop rotation a little bit more seriously before club root gets to be a problem. Uh, it'll make your life a lot, a lot easier. Okay, poll question number two. Um, hopefully that'll pop up in a second here. How often do you usually scout for club root? And that quiz, perfect, that poll's popping up right now. So we'll wait about, I think about 30 seconds. Everybody can click their answer and hit submit. And then we'll see what, the, what you guys say. That's probably good for time and we can see the results. Can we have the results pop up, please? Perfect. Okay, how often do you usually scout for club root? Awesome, 37% of you, every canola crop every year. 35% said usually, 15% rarely, 13% said never. Thank you for your honesty. That's, that's really great to know. So hopefully there's some compelling information here and you guys, uh, you know, more of you will move towards that every canola crop every year. 
All right, so another way that we can keep clubroot spores low is to scout. Um, so fewer spores, as that slide on that nice bright blue background showed, fewer spores means smaller galls, smaller patches, and more management options at the end of the day. You should be scouting every canola field every year to find it early, regardless of your crop rotation or location. You know, there's there's been canola, just for reference, there's been clubroot found um, on seed production fields in southern Alberta, where they have a mandatory one in five rotation. So, and and then that clubroot DNA found in, Saska in Swift Current this year, the spores can really end up anywhere. So, regardless of your crop rotation, regardless of your location, you should be looking for it. Um, you know, if even if you grow clubroot resistant varieties, or even especially if you're growing clubroot res resistant uh, resistant hybrids, you should be looking for it every single year. Um, speaking of resistant hybrids. Um, in 2020 alone, over 100 fields were confirmed with clubroot symptoms that were that were grown in clubroot resistant hybrids, and those samples were sent to the U of A. And Dr. Strelkov is is testing them with his team. Um, seven of those fields were from second or fields with so-called second generation resistance. There were also several fields in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Um, so so regardless of if you're growing a club resistant hybrid or not, regardless of your rotation, you should be scouting and trying to find it early. To look for it, um, pretty self-explanatory, uh, you'd, you'd think, just pull up plants, take a look at the roots. Um, with those little small galls, like in that previous photo, sometimes they'll have uh, a gall or a small swelling coming off of a lateral root or a, uh, something that's kind of sticking off. So a, a shovel can help, especially because you're going to be looking in the fall. The soil could be a little drier. It kind of helps so that the soil doesn't pull the, the gall off when you pull it out of the ground. Um, but swathing timing is sort of is easiest. It's easiest to access the field um, and also good to get the, the galls when they're kind of at their most developed. You want to start near high traffic um, or high moisture areas. And remember that symptoms are not always going to be obvious above ground. So in this case here, the top photo, um, this was actually a demonstration of different canola, uh, canola resistant, resistant canola hybrids in, in 2014 over by Bissano in Southern Alberta. Um, and there, this is a low, a low spot where some water sort of collected a little bit. Um, and you might say, oh, well, maybe it's just a wet spot and it got drowned out. But in fact, uh, the spore concentration was actually so heavy that it, it just killed the canola there. Um, and some of the hybrids were able to tolerate the pathotypes that were there a little bit more than others. So sometimes you'll expect to see these above ground symptoms. And this field right here on the bottom um, was actually uh, just southeast of Calgary. And there were some pretty nice fat swaths. And um, uh, you know, the, the grower probably could have left this another cycle of canola or two before they would have seen some really major above ground symptoms. You can see there's some weedy patches and that's kind of why they got out and started pulling plants in the first place. Um, when they were swathing, they just noticed that they didn't really get some great weed control in some areas and pulled some plants and noticed they had a problem. But this whole field was basically polluted. It looked like the infestation started um, kind of along the west side of the the field coincidentally where an, an oil pipeline had gone through about a decade earlier um, but that whole field was polluted and actually when we pulled plants at the field entrance um, there weren't uh, there weren't really anything for club root symptoms at the entrance so if we had only sampled field uh, pull, uh, plants at the entrance we might not have caught this so where we want to scout, this field does, doesn't have club root that I'm aware of. I just picked it because it's a great aerial image, but you can see some of the areas that you want to be looking um, when you're scouting for club root. So the field entrance, a pretty high traffic area. Um, you know, some of these lower spots over here, there's quite a few low spots in this field. So those tend to be a little bit wetter. You'd want to pull plants there. Around yard sites, around areas um, where there might be some water running, near some near grain bins, other high traffic areas. Um, one thing to note about clubbird is uh, it can arrive in many different ways, whether it's through the wind or farm machinery, which is which is pretty common, or exploration equipment. Um, but if you're in an area where uh, clubbird might not be super happy, to, whether it's uh, you're really dry, perhaps, or, or the the conditions are not ideal for it, it might just get pulled around the field um, by your equipment until it finds a wetter spot or a spot that it kind of would prefer to proliferate a little bit better. So it is really important to get out and check your fields whenever, whenever you're out there and try and, and cover off as many of those high risk areas as possible. Um, so this is, uh, this is my son helping soil test last summer. Um, when, when you're soil testing for club root, there's 
uh, a few different options. You can be doing a PCR test, which basically gives you a yes, no um, for that specific sample in that spot, or a qPCR, which tells you the number of spores per gram of soil in the sample that you submitted. Um, generally, you want to take those samples post-harvest or pre-seed. Uh, you'd want to sample your highest risk areas, wet, high traffic, low pH, kind of like I showed you in that map. Um, you want to collect two to three cups of soil from the top two to four inches. You can use a Dutch auger like my, my son Everett's using here. And then make sure you disinfect your sampling tools between all samples uh, so you're not contaminating. A risk with soil samples is that you could get, you could get false negatives if the sample's taken in the wrong, like the wrong spot. So perhaps you, um, you know, perhaps there was a clubbert spot behind Everett over here and there was no spores right where he's standing. So you could get a, a false negative just because of the patchy nature of clubbert. Um, and then also if you, um, if you take a composite sample and perhaps sample all over the field and then combine all those into one, you could be diluting the sample a little bit. So you really wanna focus on the high risk areas. Um, and before you do soil sampling, I would just check with the province you're in um, to see if there are available testing programs uh, that would cover the cost of that for you. All right, poll number three. Do you or your customers grow club root resistant hybrids? I'll give you about 30 seconds here. I think I started a little bit late. I really hope I'm not taking as much time as, as it looks like on the clock. So do you or your customers grow club root resistant hybrids? And I'll just give a couple more seconds and then we'll pull up the answers just in the interest of time. All right, let's see those answers. All right, so every canola acre, 13%. Um, so there's still, 2% that say that every canola acre in the community is still clubbert susceptible um, and 31 that say most are clubbert susceptible. Okay, so let's, let's talk about clubbert resistance a little bit more then. Okay, so the concept behind growing clubbert resistant cultivars is that finding clubbert as it arrives is really difficult. Um, the, the, sp the patches can start small, it can arrive before spores or, or before symptoms are actually present. Perhaps you pulled plants from the wrong spot. Infestations can get missed for years and then spore concentrations and potentially novel pathotypes that we don't have resistance for can build up to catastrophic levels. So if deployed early and the caveat on that is with other BMPs, um, club root hybrids will help keep spore loads manageable. It's not a silver bullet, but it can slow the rate of spore multiplication. Um, this is a really great photo that I got from Dane Fries with Manitoba Ag um, of a grower in Manitoba in 2020 who was seeding, um, was seeding, ran out of one hybrid that was club root, uh, I believe it was a club root susceptible hybrid. So the, the next bag he was able to get was club root resistant. And he ended up doing a really cool side-by-side -side trial by accident. And the patch on the right here, or the, the strip on the right, was the susceptible hybrid. And on the left was the resistant hybrid. So resistant hybrids work really well. Um, and in combination with, uh, with scouting and with crop rotation. So I really, really urge all of you to be looking for uh, clubber resistant hybrids this year. This is that list C uh, Dr. Strelkov showed as well in his presentation. I want to make note that um, the, the cultivars that aren't starred um, all have the same resistance source. So some call it first generation, some call it Mandel. Um, and that's a really good place to start. So make sure that this year uh, in 2021, when you're out looking at variety trials, you specifically look for cultivars that are, are clubber resistant. Another important uh, way to keep spore concentrations low is to control brassica weeds in all crops. Um, your brassica weeds, of course, are volunteer canola, stinkweed, shepherd's purse, uh, mustards, flickseed. Um, you want to control these in canola and non-canola years. Even volunteer canola in canola can, um, you know, in a resistant canola can be can be multiplying spores. So it's all about keeping spore concentrations low and keeping the pressure down. Gall formation for clubbert usually occurs about four to eight weeks after the initial infection. Um, and you wanna control your weeds early to minimize that gall formation. So you have less resting spores released back into the soil. All right, so we talked about um, keeping spores low. Now we're gonna talk about keeping spores local. And I only have a few more slides, so hopefully you guys can hang in there with me. Um, 
sanitation or biosecurity is really, really important. It's sort of a difficult thing to talk about and it it's kind of can, sounds like it might be a pain in the butt, um, but a good sanitation plan will help prevent um, and or contain club root. The best way to manage club root is to avoid getting it in the first place if you can. Um, and remember that wherever soil moves, the spores go with it. Uh, and you want to sit down and talk with your, you know, with your farming partners about a sanitation plan that you can actually stick to and follow. You can see the cedar here has quite a bit of, or some soil on it, I guess. Uh, Southern Alberta is not super, super wet. So I didn't have a great picture of a muddy cedar. But, um, you know, in this case, even just bashing some of the dirt off uh, would, would go a long ways before removing fields. So you could uh, sanitize to prevent club root by restricting access. Uh, so just trying to let as few people into your fields as possible um, or people from outside your community as well. Uh, avoid soil movement. So try and minimize tillage. Try not to work in muddy conditions. Um, you know, if you don't have it already, a rough clean is probably good enough. Just taking some of that dirt off before you leave a field. Once you get club root, it becomes a little more difficult. Def definitely still want to restrict access. You want to avoid soil movement even more. So avoid tillage, avoid working in muddy conditions, notify relevant parties. So if somebody has to enter your land and you know you have club root, make sure they're aware so they take extra precautions. Um, so you're not the field that they're sort of rushing through and just sort of um, perhaps uh, don't worry about uh, taking the mud off because you don't want to be responsible for spreading this disease around your community. Um, you can work or travel the infested field last. You can grass in an area near the exit and then uh, use that area for cleaning your equipment before leaving the field. That's kind of a patch management strategy, but also for, for kind of keeping that soil within your field. And then sanitizing equipment could be another thing to look at. There's three steps in sanitation. Uh, there's a rough clean, which you could remove about 90 to 95% of the soil. That would take 90 to 95% of the spores off. So that's probably good enough, um, especially considering the amount of time it takes for the next two steps, pressure washing or, um, you know, with pressurized air, taking the rest of the soil and then sanitizing. The point is find a plan, stick with it um, and do the best you can to minimize the impact of this disease. Um, finally, we want to make sure that we reduce tillage and soil movement. Uh, a reminder, again, that I sound like a broken record, but P. brassicae spores move wherever soil moves. We know that convention of conventional tillage buries crop residue, it disturbs soil, it makes soil particles a lot more vulnerable to erosion from rain, running water, wind. Um, and also on the top of that, the tillage equipment itself can carry hundreds of pounds of soil to the next field where it's then going to mix those in with your fields. So crop residue that's intact, it cushions the impact of rain, it anchors soil and those spores. Um, so reducing tillage will reduce soil and spore movement between fields. And if you're starting to move towards tillage, I really, uh, I really encourage you to kind of start going back the other way. So another, um, and this I think is my final point, um, is uh, club root patch management to keep spores both low and local. So patch management can both reduce spore concentration in the patch itself, and it can also reduce soil movement um, from the patch to other areas in the field. So the first and most important thing that, that you can do is mark the patch borders or have an idea of where, where that patch actually is. You can remove and destroy the galls. And then if you're trying to, um, and then you can grass in that patch. So that'll help anchor the soil. That'll give that patch some more years out of a susceptible host. And then to reduce the spore concentration further, you could play around with lime or a fumigant uh, within that patch. Um, there is more information available on, on those practices. I'm just kind of touching on stuff a little bit quickly here. And then <clears throat> to reduce the soil movement from, from that patch, grassing in that patch is pretty important. As I said, it anchors the soil. Um, but then also grassing it in would also encourage you to avoid driving over it, which, um, which would prevent you moving it, moving soil around and if you're not seeding through that patch anymore, you're not going to be pulling that soil from the patch to other areas in your field showing uh, or having, having the club roots spread around as much. So um, yeah, I just ask everybody when you are thinking about club root this year, I, I really hope everybody tries to kind of make some sense of all the noise, keep spores low, keep spores local, um, crop rotation, scouting and club root resistant hybrids are really, really important. Also control your weeds, um, implement some patch management and sanitation and 
And I know that uh, it seems like in recent years, uh, there, there just tends to be a bit more tillage going on in, in the prairies. And if there's any way you can reduce it on your farm uh, and reduce soil, soil movement, you're going to be going a long way for clubroot management. There's a lot of really great clubroot resources out there. Clubroot.ca um, is, is a really great resource. There's up-to-date maps. Um, there's some great fact sheets available on our website, and then uh, Canola Watch is another uh, another really great resource that has sort of shorter articles on on issues like clubroot. So that is my presentation, um, and I think we're doing a Q and A now. So I'll mute myself and stop my my screen sharing. I think Mickey. Yes, please. Thank you for your presentation, Autumn. So. We to leave you hanging partly through the introduction there's the the joys of technology when the when the internet drops off so, um so there will be so the the qr code will be displayed here now so you have the option if you haven't put your cca number in uh, to the chat box along with your name you can uh, scan the, the QR code that is up on the screen and uh, you will be registered for your credits at that point of time. So the government of, Saskatch of Saskatchewan and its partners are conducting an annual pest monitoring survey again this summer. Information gained from the pest monitoring survey is valuable and directly benefits the growers in Saskatchewan and across the prairies. Pest monitoring information allows early detection and mapping of new or emerging pests, it gives producers the best knowledge to make better management decisions and anticipates developing pest, manage, uh, pest issues. So we encourage Saskatchewan growers to sign up for the Saskatchewan Pest Monitoring Program to allow access to your land and to conduct the pest surveys. So there, you'll see another QR code will be displayed up here on the, on the screen. So please scan the QR code displayed on the screen to sign up or contact the Ag Knowledge Center at 1-866-457-2377. Greater participation leads to greater results. And at the very beginning of of uh, Dr. Havan's presentation, he had the QR code up there. And so I did a quick scan of it and it probably took me 45 seconds to a minute at the most to be able to get registered for it. So it's a very easy process. So we are now into our Q and A portion of our meeting. So questions can be asked by typing the Q and A or typing in the Q and A box and they will be addressed as they come forward. Although as mentioned before, the ones with the most likes, we will try and make sure we address them first. So if you have specific presenters you wish to hear from, please address them in your presentation. So unfortunately, when I lost um, internet connection, I also, all the, the chat room and my Q&A got erased. So. I've got a few of the questions written down here and some of the new ones have been, have been typed in so we can get to those. But after that, I'll ask Mickey to step in and fill in for the ones of the questions that got erased on me. So we've got a question from Barb. Um, is there a timeline from finding the pathogen DNA in the soil to when you start seeing it above ground symptoms, as in the map we saw in Southwest Saskatchewan. And I think that was probably during um, Ali Zero's presentation. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for the question. So there, there are research, uh, actually research conducted and, uh, and Dr. Esterikov can comment on this as well. But uh, this, this is very complicated because it can be uh, affected by the agricultural practices in a very uh, large extent. So uh, like, like uh, what, what I indicated for the two, uh, two fields uh, in southwestern Saskatchewan, 
these two fields were found in areas with, uh, with quite nice rotation. So hopefully uh, when we have nice rotation, uh, which is uh, at least uh, a two years break between canola crops in a three year rotation, or, or if the pathogen is known to be present, so it would be a four year rotation. So it would be three years between canola crops. So hopefully, with these uh, types of rotation uh, and also using the resistant cultivars, as Autumn mentioned from, from beginning, uh, the pathogen won't be able to build up the population to get to the level that can cause the disease. So as I said, uh, perhaps when we see these uh, uh, two fields through voluntary uh, soil DNA testing, perhaps the, DNA, the pathogen itself with no disease already present in many more fields. So uh, it puts actually, this soil uh, testing program puts the producer in a very nice position to manage the disease early as they know the DNA of the pathogen is found so they can uh, implement the uh, management practices that Atom is, uh, has already covered and don't let the pathogen build up the uh, population. So uh, having the pathogen itself it does not mean that we get the disease. We need the pathogen, we need the, uh, to get uh, to build up the population. We need a host and we need the environment like the disease triangle and the pathogen does not mean the disease. So hopefully with good uh, agricultural practices, uh, we don't uh, get uh, to, pathogen doesn't get to the level that can cause diseases in areas that we have them uh, in our map uh, with blue uh, as their color for now. Thank you. Uh, next question was, uh, there's a question about the uh, quick description of the bylaws. So I believe that would be, Ali Reza, I believe that was uh, during your presentation too, you talked about the bylaws. Yeah, I guess so. So uh, because bylaws are now uh, have a play, actually are playing a significant role in management of the, the disease. So uh, the Pest Control Act, uh, actually under the Pest Control Act, uh, the Ministry of Agriculture and Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, SARM, uh, have drafted a sample club root bylaw and policy. So you can find that sample club root bylaw and policy on SARM website uh, that can be implemented by an RM councils. So this draft that prepared, uh, the draft makes club root reporting mandatory within the RM and also uh, has some guidance on uh, how the club root can be reported and, and, and management through the uh, producer driven approach. However, this is only a draft. So, uh, so the best thing is uh, each producer contacts their own RM office. And uh, essentially if they have, uh, they have a bylaw already in place and enacted and ask for a copy of, copy of the bylaw because, because it, is, uh, it is to the RM to revise this draft or even use it or not or revise the draft the way they think uh, uh, actually best fits uh, their interest for that RM. Thank you, Ali Reza. There was also a, there was a question to probably dealing with the, with the same with, the, with that survey. Um, and it was talk about, uh, they talked about the RM189, but I think with all the RMs, when that survey was done last fall, um, you know, where to drop the soil samples off. Is, is that program wrapped up now for last year or is there still an ability to, to drop some samples off? So uh, that's a great question. Uh, the, pro the program wrapped up for 2020. So, uh, so all, all of the uh, uh, samples uh, were analyzed, producers and RMs uh, contacted accordingly. Uh, and at this time, we are uh, actually planning a new uh, program for 2021. And then we are working with Sask Canola because last year Sask Canola covered all the costs and also partnered in the activities in many different ways, in addition to covering the cost. 
So th this is the time now that we are consulting with SAS Canolo, SARB, SCIC, and other partners to, to actually establish the 2021 program. I uh, hope that we can continue that, uh, uh, that valuable soil DNA testing. And then uh, if we have that, usually the producer, if we uh, still set up the uh, website, so the pro producers can ship the samples directly to the lab. Also, they can drop them in their regional offices, like 189, I guess it would be Wayburn, uh, which uh, our crop specialist, I guess, Michael Brown, if I don't make mistakes. Or, or they can also talk to their PHOs, their SARB division PHO. If I don't make mistake for, for 189, it is Joanne, uh, Joanne Kwasniki. So, and also uh, I, if, if Mickey has any comment that if that RM also can access to any SAS Canola office, but, but there are many ways that uh, the samples can be submitted and tested. Thank you. Uh, there's a research question here. So uh, I'll direct it to Dr. Strokov. Uh, either, either or any of the presenters want to um, add in on it, so please feel free to do so. So is there research done on biological control of club root, like in the form of club root, uh, in form of seed coatings? Similar method to how we inoculate with mycorrhiza or um, rhizobium on other crops? Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, maybe I'll turn on my, my camera too. Yeah, so uh, there, there has been some work done on that, particularly uh, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, there was quite a bit of work from uh, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada regarding uh, biological control. Uh, and, 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 and they evaluate a large number of biological control agents. Unfortunately, the, the result in the field there was very good results obtained in greenhouse trials and so on, but the results in the field were very um, variable. So one year, I remember there was very good results. Another year, it didn't do anything. So, so that and that's an issue we often face with biocontrol agents. If they're, if you know, so so that work has kind of slowed down. But in terms of the seed treatment, the issue would be that uh, we we've, we've tried, uh, for instance, fungicidal seed treatment and so on. But because the, the pathogen is, is uh, soil borne and it persists there, the, the seed treatments don't seem to, whether they be biological or whether they are, they're chemical, they, they seem to have a, a very transient effect. So, so the, you know, as the plant continues to grow, it eventually still becomes infected as I guess it, it leaves the area, uh, you know, as, as the roots spread beyond, you know, the area where the seed had been and, and maybe the, the effects of, of, of the seed treatment were off. So, so it's, not very, uh, it's not a very effective way to control uh, the, sea, the disease in, in fields that are already infested. It is useful if there's very low levels of infestation or if the, um, or, or to, to eliminate the possibility of seed borne transmission as an external contaminant. That's uh, kind of a very brief summary. Okay, thank you. Um, a question here on the idea, or do we have an idea of what percentage of fields in Saskatchewan will be seeded to a club root variety? And I think, you know, Autumn put up the, um, her, her survey, you know, so it'll give us a bit of an idea here for Western Canada, but I probably, um, probably Dr. Coven would be the one to, to answer for the Saskatchewan specific. Uh, so uh, uh, actually it, it seems that there is no uh, uh, official numbers for, for this, but uh, but I, I, I uh, chatted quickly with my, uh, my colleague, Corey Jacob. Corey Jacob. So uh, it seems that uh, SASC uh, uh, Crop Insurance Company, uh, as part of the SASC Management Plus, they uh, break down canola acres uh, by variety, uh, but that of course does not include all the producers. On the other hand, perhaps private industry will have some numbers, but uh, but they are, they are not actually perhaps uh, uh, freely available. Uh, there is, uh, there is uh, a table on uh, Sask Management Plus uh, of uh, Saskatchewan Crop Insurance uh, 
company website that uh, it has this canola provincial average yields by variety uh, that is uh, mainly provided by producers themselves. So uh, this is uh, what uh, I am aware of uh, regarding this, uh, actually uh, regarding each, regarding the acreage of uh, each specific variety at this time. Thank you. There, um, probably another question for Dr. O'Kevin would be so on the Saskatchewan, on the provincial monitoring programs for pests and weeds, is quad root sampling part of this program? Yeah, so uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. So uh, uh, again, uh, we have uh, all, uh, for disease surveys, we have all the disease surveys excluding uh, claw root specific survey uh, that they need permission from the producers. So claw root specific survey in a high risk area is under the Pest Control Act uh, and it's done by pest control officers uh, that they can access the land without permission. So that's a different thing, uh, this claw root specific survey, but all other surveys on canola and lentils, field peas, all other surveys that I named at the start of my beginning, uh, at the start of my talk, they need the producer's permission. So uh, specific to a general canola disease survey, uh, when the surveyor gets to the land with permission, uh, they check all the diseases. So they check black leg, they check sclerotinia, alternaria, asterialose, foot rot. And then while they are checking black leg and uh, perhaps root rot, they also, of course, take a look if the clobrit is present or not, and they mention uh, yes or no. But for the soil sampling through general cannula disease survey, they need another permission from the producers. So if the producer grants the permission, they also collect samples from that field through general cannula disease survey. If the producer does not grant, they don't. So I guess I covered, and that's, that's very valuable. But uh, on, the, on, on the other hand, uh, this year we didn't find any claw root uh, pathogen or claw root symptom through the general cannula disease survey. Thank you. Um, so next, suggested that, club root path, that the club root pathogen can be more prevalent in wetter areas. Has any research looked into predicting club root expansion through water movement, such as water flows within the watersheds and tributaries? And so I would say, Dr. Strelkov or, um, or Autumn, please, this question be towards you. Okay, uh, maybe I'll try answering and, and Autumn can add, there, uh, can add some questions. We, the, the, um, the movement of the spores has been documented, uh, particularly in Australia, in irrigation water and in uh, movement th through, through, through those kind of, uh, when they were taking, for instance, uh, particularly the sediments from canals and, and so on. Uh, in, in Canada, there hasn't been that much work. There, there's definitely evidence that it moves like in water runs. So from one field to another at, in the spring, there, uh, if there's a water run, we've seen uh, the, the movement along with volunteers of, 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 of infested soil. There hasn't been a, a thorough study looking at, you know, for instance, over a, watersh a watershed scale or on such a large scale. Um, you know, I guess there could be some risk, uh, but as 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 the water gets more and more diluted, let's say it goes into a stream, then into a river, that then it becomes it becomes less of a less of a risk. But but definitely, at least on a on a local scale, or re, you know, there, there there can be some concerns associated with that, similar to soil erosion and anything that moves the soil around. Yeah, and I think if I were to add anything to that, I would say that that, that just kind of highlights the importance of, of minimum tillage, right? Um, anything that's going to reduce uh, reduce soil erosion into that water in the first place is going to reduce uh, spore movement. So I think zero tillage is, or, or minimum tillage is something that we, we really need to make sure we remember, um, you know, even on, on these wet years or years where people might start to, to move towards a, a heavier uh, tillage practice. Thank you. If we're, 
we will run this past. I see we've got about five minutes left, but we will run it a little bit over to make sure we get some more questions answered. But if some of your questions don't get answered in the chat, there was the email addresses for presenters were, were posted there. So if you want to email them with any direct questions, please feel free to do so. And another question was, will copies of the presentation be made available after? And yes, they will be, but I will maybe ask uh, Mickey if she would just explain to, to where we can, where the, pre or where the participants can go to access that. Yes, the recordings and the presentations will be available and sent to all the participants and register people who are registered um, via email. And it also can be found on SAS Canola's website um, on the main page. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, question, probably, I, I'm going to direct this one to Autumn. Are there enough um, seed all canola acres in Western Canada. You cut out for a second there. I think the question okay. was, are there enough canola? Is there enough are canola there enough, available? Uh, of the, of the club root resistant varieties, are there going to, are there enough, is there enough seed available to, to seed all the canola acres in Western Canada? So the, the club roots or the club root seed companies, the, the canola seed companies are all working towards grow to, towards all club root resistance long term. This is a this is something we're going towards. And you'll see as you tour varieties and see new cultivar new hybrids, sorry, uh, new hybrids or cultivars coming out, they're they're going to be predominantly club root resistant. So if everybody changed their cropping plans today on February eleventh, I'm sure that uh, that would create a lot of a lot of headaches. But um, you know, the science supports using clever resistant cultivars and the seed companies are responding to that and supporting that by, by putting forward hybrids that are clever resistant. So yes, that's, that's a place that we're going and, um, you know, the growers and, and the, the people uh, out there who are selling seed are, should be prepared for that for sure. Thank you. Uh, do you correlate pH of the soil to spores per gram of soil? So probably Dr. Strokov or Autumn on this one. Yeah, we've looked at it both ways in this in 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 this in the analysis I just presented, the one from Andrea, the, the student, it was looking just at inoculum at the, at the impact on inoculum density. But we have done studies where we looked looked at um, pH and the C severity. And, and, and that's where we found that there is a kind of a negative correlation that as, as the pH increases, decreases, sorry, that the C's increases, but it's not that strong as, as, as you know, maybe one would have been led if, to believe if you had read like papers from the 1950s or 60s. There's definitely a relationship there, but, I, but there's many other factors that, that probably have, you know, uh, a very important role in severity and inoculum density. Thank you. Uh, there, the next question. I'd, I'll throw this one probably back to Autumn, but if anybody else wants to, uh, other other presenters want to to uh, participate in it, it'd be good. Uh, so, when are non-resistant varieties going to be banned? And you touched a little bit on this, Autumn, but uh, would you mind commenting a little bit more of when you could see the the, the non-resistant varieties fully leaving the, the system? I don't, I don't know that um, they would be banned. I mean, maybe long term, like in the registration trials, um, there might be a point where where they wouldn't accept cultivars that were um, that were clever resistant or weren't clever resistant. But that would that would be something for the the WCCRC board to decide. Um, I think going forward, we're going to just see sort of more of a push. Um, in Alberta, like just for some, you know, napkin math, uh, a, a colleague of mine kind of went through the, the crop insurance data um, and compared that to total canola acres. And we were about 60% um, of canola hybrids grown in Alberta were, were club root resistant hybrids. So I think in the next few years, we're just going to see it kind of overtake and, and just become a larger majority. And um yeah. So, do I have a, a year prediction? No, but the sooner the sooner the better agronomically. And and when we think about 
um, you know, managing this disease and preventing it from being a problem. Like the, the sooner we all get on board with this um, and adopt uh, club root resistance on all acres in combination with rotation, in combination with scouting, um, you know, I think the better. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if we want to win this battle against club root, then, then let's get on it and start actually adopting these things at a large scale. Yeah, so it'd be similar to um, the, 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 I guess, the, the black leg breeding to where the companies cannot bring over varieties that don't have black leg resistance in them or meet a certain level of black leg resistance in them. So that's all the, the questions I've got. Oh, oh, there's a couple more just came up here, so I will lead through those. So if you have club root and are growing a res oh. Oh, so you know you have club root and are growing a resistant variety. If you have a pathotype that breaks through the plant's resistance, will that plant reproduce spores from all pathotypes? And probably Dr. Strokov for this one. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, typically, the the if if you have a pathotype that that breaks the resistance, the 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 spores that are produced from that plant from those roots. Will will be uh, enriched for that particular pathotype that could break the resistance. That's why it's, they become so much more common. For instance, this pathotype three A was probably there already, and I think we have some evidence that it was there like years ago. But it was a very small component of the pathogen population. But because it was one of the few that could re reproduce itself on the susceptible on the resistant host, it became a bigger and bigger portion of the of the pathogen population. Having said that, there is a little bit of evidence that some non-virulent pathotypes can almost piggyback a little bit. And uh, when, so let's say you have a, a resistant variety that's resistant to pathotype 3A, 3H, but it's susceptible to 3A. There's a little bit of evidence that as, as it becomes susceptible to 3A, the, the other pathotype 3H can kind of piggyback itself and reproduce also a little bit, but, but typically we be more enriched for the resistance breaking pathotype. Thank you. Keys, there is a really good question on the chat box. Um, can I read it for the last question? Sure, that sounds great. Thanks. Are the club root resistant varieties specific to pesotypes? Will there be any value in getting pesotype testing for club root, um, club root pesotypes? Yeah. I, I can try to answer, and if if, if Ali Reza or Alam have other questions, um, so so in my my experience, companies will actually look for for material, like when they're breeding, they they test against all the kind of quote unquote prevalent pathotypes, so that they 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 make sure. They're trying to make sure that if, even though it's bred for resistance to pathotype 3A, it still carries resistance to 3H or other pathotypes. So, so they, they, they do try to make it that it carries like a broad spectrum resistance to most pathotypes. Of course, there are these newer pathotypes and it's not possible necessarily to include resistance to all of that. So there can be some, some value in, in knowing what what uh, what the pathotype is in particular fields. The only thing is there's not really a commercially available service that you could because it's just so much work to pathotype right now that you could, you know, like like you know that you could just send it to a lab and in in and and the, and you pay a small fee and you get the pathotype designation back. So that's been a limit. So we try to get as many as we can representative, but 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 it's not I don't think pathotype testing is commercially available or really commercially viable right now. Thank you. There was a, a question about, are all the other industries that enter farmer's land, like the oil industry and SAS power, made aware of soil movement and the danger of club root movement of spores? So um, probably Autumn or Dr. Akhaven on this one. Yeah, I can comment on this. Um, so uh, I know, like I just I just got the club root file over the over the winter and I know in previous years there have has been engagement with for example the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers um, and there has been some education and extension out to them to make sure they are aware um, I, I can't speak for Saskatchewan specifically um, but I know that that information is available and 
sometimes I think the, the way to make these changes are, you know, to, to approach it at different, at different levels. So going from the top through the association of Canadian association of petroleum producers through kind of the parent companies, but also, um, you know, to the growers and the people who are allowing access when you're negotiating agreements, when, when you're agreeing to let people come on your land, ask them what the sanitation plan is. Um, and make sure they do have one. Um, there are resources you could refer them to, uh, to clubroot.ca. Uh, in Alberta, I think it's a lot more common, at least, to be talked about and known about, just because we have more of an established clubroot presence. But um, I, I would really encourage all the growers here, anybody who's allowing access to their land, to have conversations with every single organization that's coming on their land, um, or, or to have some set list of expectations for, for what you have. And you want to be reasonable as well like I know um I heard of one club root policy I got a call a couple of years ago from somebody who was saying you know I've got a grower who says they won't they won't let me on their land unless I can you know they can eat off of the tires of my truck um so so that's one side of it but on the other side you also have uh situations where you know people are bringing in equipment that's in some cases quite muddy um and they're just coming in and traveling traveling your land with with no um no 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 sanitation or biosecurity at all so um you know that's why uh, i kind of got rushed at the end because i was worried about about time but um you know thinking about a sanitation plan a biosecurity plan that's going to work for your farm and talking with all the stakeholders involved is really 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 important like finding something that'll work for you that you'll stick with that you'll enforce um, because, uh, because yeah, I mean, any, any time soil's coming on your land, I mean, through the wind, you can't really stop it, especially in Southern Alberta where I am. And we seem to have typhoons like every day this year, but, um, you know, but, but these big kind of super spreaders, um, you know, big muddy equipment coming on is something you do have control over and you can exercise that. Hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Hey, thanks Autumn. And, and uh, as a farmer that's, in the Westminster area where we have lots of oil field activity and, and they're on the land quite off. Um, I would, I would just say that, that uh, make sure you have that conversation when they come, when they come out, they, they do have that protocol that the oil companies have that they follow, but as a landowner, you still have want to watch the contractors because even though the oil company's got that protocol there, Keep an eye on the contractors and and just make sure that they're abiding by that protocol because sometimes they all try and find a few shortcuts so so always be aware of them um so uh keith uh, just uh to add uh, yeah i totally agree with what you indicated and what autumn indicated all the great points specific to uh our situation in saskatchewan uh, we are now uh uh, in the process of developing the biosecurity guidelines through the Ministry of Agriculture and Partners. And then uh, I guess this, this will be done uh, quite, quite uh, shortly and then will be distributed to uh, the stakeholders uh, to, uh, to actually uh, exchange ideas. Uh, uh, biosecurity is a, is, is a big point here. And then uh, I guess in less than two weeks, uh, Saskatchewan... Uh, Global Initiative meeting uh, will have uh, their their annual meeting, and one of the items on the agenda is the biosecurity that we are going to address. And we have uh, we have uh, quite a comprehensive membership from all the uh, parties actually that 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 named uh, named uh, here and in the question. Thank you. Question of uh, do growers complain about yield drag? using club root resistant varieties in your area. So Autumn, I'll maybe have you address this first, please. Sure. Um, so, so in my area specifically, I, I, I wouldn't want to get into that, but, but at the, at the end of the day, like when you add something to a hybrid, sometimes there, there is a yield penalty for it. Sometimes there's not. Um, so I encourage you guys, like I, I wouldn't want to say that in, you know, so-and-so's area for sure there, there won't be or, or anything like that. But, um, you know, certainly in, in central Alberta or in an area where you have high spore concentrations, you're going to have a massive yield penalty um, for, for growing a susceptible hybrid. Um, and if you have clubroot spores build up, you are certainly going to have a yield drag um, because clubroot is going to be affecting the yield on your field. So um, I would encourage you to 
to look. I mean, that list uh, of clever resistant hybrids, and I linked to it in the chat, there are quite a few available. Um, so I would make sure you look at variety trials in your area. Um, sorry, I just, I thought there was a follow-up question. So I, I would look at specifically variety trials in your area, like go out to, assuming there's normal-ish tours this summer, uh, you can look at canolaperformancetrials.ca. Um, that's the, not like the independent yield yield trials for for uh, canola. So short answer, kind of hard, kind of hard to say, but uh, the risk outweighs, you know, if there is a bit of a small yield penalty, then the risk um, definitely outweighs it. Thanks, Autumn. I've I found that there originally there was a bit of a yield drag on, on some of the newer varieties, but they've been a lot long and you know, there's some, the, the, the club root resistant varieties out there are some of the top yielding varieties that are, it's a matter of if you want to find that package to where, you know, you have that, that club root resistance and the best harvest management and every other trait you want to stack in there sometimes uh, becomes difficult and there's some trade-offs to be made. So I'm going to, I'm going to have one last question here, just because I, I think it's a really important one. To, to be addressed and before we wrap it up here. Um, but if there are any other questions, yeah, please feel free to reach out to their presenters at their email addresses and they could answer that one. And the last one would be, wouldn't switching to club root resistant varieties before necessary be like taking penicillin without cause? So I'll maybe go back to Autumn on this one, please. Um, hey, Larry, long time no see. Uh, so uh, thanks for the question. Um, short answer, no. Um, if clubber were easier to find before it became established, um, then you could make the case, um, perhaps, that you could wait to, to implement growing resistant hybrids. But the problem is that um, clubber root or clubber root spores, P. brassicae spores, build up in soil and build up and build up and build up. And if you don't find them, you're going to have a massive problem. And I've been enough in enough fields in my career, and I've had colleagues and you know in enough fields in, my, in their careers to see that um, you know when your spores get to astronomical levels, you're forced to make pretty extreme decisions about um, you know lengthening rotation, uh, sanitation. Everything gets more difficult. So no, it's not the same as prophylactically taking uh, an antibiotic. Um, this is really about maintaining low spore concentrations so you can find the, the spores when there's a low um, risk in combination with using, um, in combination with, with rotation, in combination with scouting. So, um, you know, giving everybody an, an antibiotic just for fun and then never following up is one thing. Um, you know, growing club resistant hybrids on your farm to keep spore concentrations low while you're scouting, while you're having a crop rotation that involves more than canola and wheat um, is, is really, really important. And the science supports that. And there's been quite a bit of discussion on that. So yeah, if, if anyone has further questions about that, you're welcome to, to give me a call. I'm happy to, uh, to share some more information with you, but that is a, uh, something that has been discussed at many levels throughout the Clubbert Steering Committee, the science community, uh, seed companies, and and this is something that there is agreement on, and um, and I strongly recommend that everybody gets on board with that sooner than later. Thanks, Autumn. That's a that is a very good question, and and one that a lot of farmers do have. So th this is the end of today's webinar. Thank you very much for participating here today, and thanks again to all of our presenters. Please join us at the next webinar on harvest and storage management which is scheduled for February 18th, one week from today. The registration page for the upcoming webinars can be found on the Sask Canola, Sask Barley, Alberta Canola, and the Manitoba Canola Growers Association's websites. You'll receive an email with the survey link when you leave this webinar. Please provide feedback on, on the webinar. We want to hear from you. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.